Okay, the webinar is now broadcasting to all attendees. Uh, I'm going to give it a minute before we actually start the proceedings because uh, Zoom lately has been, uh, it takes a while for people to actually click in. So um, let's just, uh, Peter and Mike, how are you, uh, how are the two of you doing? We're not gonna actually start yet, we're gonna wait a minute, um, but how are you doing? And uh, okay, let's, let's talk about an irreverent question while we're waiting for people to come in. What is the one thing that you're missing the most during this quarantine? Uh, you know, for me, it's, uh, it's visiting the coiffure because, you know, I, I really miss having my hair done. It's, it's clearly getting very shaggy. So uh, that's what I miss the most. And I, I probably speak for the other two people on the call as well. Yes. Um, I would say, Chris, uh, probably just the, the uh, interaction with uh, friends uh, going out, you know, on the weekends, dinner, that type of stuff. So, so kind of general stuff. That's, uh, I'm going to go with Peter. Uh, Mike, I think that's a very <laughs> nice, and it, it demonstrates your ultimate niceness as a human being, I think. Uh, I'm going to go with Peter. My, um, we have somehow in, I have these 20 year old wall clippers that I've been using to give myself, you know, uh, buzz cuts. And we, somehow we've lost the attachment that uh, is required for it. So it's either all or nothing, essentially. Uh, <laughs> and so I was, I was in the, yeah, I, I didn't do it this morning. Anyway, okay, so we've got, um, so let's start. I think we have enough uh, participants on that we'll start and everybody can join us as we go. So uh, I'm going to share my screen for the, uh, for the actual presentation. Okay, welcome to MedCan Presents, the twice a week webinar series that happens every Tuesday and Thursday at 12.30 p.m with employer-focused Safe at Work system webinars on Tuesdays and wellness-focused webinars on Thursdays. Today's webinar is Testing Antibody Screening in Context. My name is Christopher Shulgin, joined today with uh, Dr. Peter Nord and Mike Galiga. Dr. Peter Nord is MedCan's Chief Medical Officer. How are you, Peter? I'm good, thanks, Chris. And Mike Galiga is MedCan's Chief Risk Officer. Okay, let's go through our bios, back to the sharing of the screen, we're gonna go uh, and slideshow here. Uh, okay, so Dr. Peter Nord is MedCan's Chief Medical Officer. Previously, Peter was a VP Chief Medical Officer at Unity Health Toronto. Mike Galiga, I'll, I'll leave you folks to just kind of read through the rest on your own. Mike Galiga, MedCan's Chief Risk Officer, oversees all of MedCan's non-financial risks, including regulatory, facility, clinical, and privacy compliance. Mike also has accountability for MedCan's real estate national affiliate network and its in-house specialist physician. Okay. Uh, Peter, why don't you give us a pandemic update to, uh, to start and then we can shift to Mike's presentation after that. Yeah, so obviously things continue to develop on a day-by-day -day kind of perspective. And, and a couple of interesting things that to just pull out from the last week or so, in, uh, in Ontario and in Canada, just in general, our recoveries, the number of people that have recovered from COVID-19 are now either approaching or have actually surpassed the number of active cases. So that's, that's a nice milestone that we've had people kind of, turn. it's another way to think about turning the corners. We have more people kind of getting better than getting worse. That's sort of a high level way to think about where we are. And you know, the whole point of flattening the curve was really to take the pressure off our healthcare system and the, and the capacity, which is a fixed capacity, of course. And we uh, realized early that we'd have to add capacity. And so that happened very quickly through March and April with hospitals adding ICU beds, uh, decanting and switching the kind of hospital use that they were applying in, the, in those beds, uh, trying to get as much ventilator uh, capacity built very quickly. The good news is, we have, even at our peak uh, in all the provinces, but even again, Canada as a whole, we never actually got close to the capacity. And what we're seeing now, and specifically in Ontario, is that, that the, we were at, you know, at some point, 50% of our capacity, that's actually dropping now. Our hospitalization rates, which were in April at, at about 8.5% of all the positive cases, has already down dropped to 2.78%. So that's 
not even ICU, but just people that are sick enough to be admit, admitted to the hospital. And that's really what this is all about. So we can talk about the, the case rates high, you know, maybe we could do a better job there. That's great. And, you know, our, our percentage of active cases, there's lots of ways to slice the data. But the one thing we really take away is, for me, is the admission rate to hospitals, admission rate to ICU and ventilator use. And we're absolutely winning on all three of those parameters. And, and we, according to those parameters, we have turned the corner. Of course, you can't take our foot off the gas. We still need to move forward with this. Critically important that we move forward. The other stat that I, I picked up over the last week is if you look at all the people that were tested, not tested positive, but all the people across Canada that had tested, uh, about 96% actually test negative. Only, uh, sorry, 94%, 6%, give or take, uh, typically test positive uh, over the last uh, two months. But if you take the total amount, the death rate, the number of people that have died over the total test number is 0.44%. And that number is probably going to go even lower. So you're going to hear different numbers about death rates. Uh, you have to be really careful when you hear death rate. What's the numerator, which of course is the, the number of people that have passed away, and then what's the denominator that they're using? And if you look at the bigger denominator, we're really at about 0.44% deaths. And uh, you know, no death uh, is a good thing, but uh, that's a that's a, a a number that we think we're going to see actually decrease uh, in the future as the denominator continues to get bigger and bigger. So that's a couple of the highlights in the last week. Uh, things are changing, uh, but we're generally going in the right direction. Obviously, uh, Quebec uh, still has a, a great number of cases. Ontario second. Uh, in Ontario, two-thirds of all the cases are coming from Toronto. So we definitely are not at the end of this. And in Ontario, we just uh, extended the state of emergency again uh, because yesterday, I think we had about 400 new positive cases, which again is a bit of a red flag. So. Again, uh, can't take our foot off the gas, got to keep moving in the same direction and, and look for all the wins that we can. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, uh, it's nice uh, to hear that we're, at least we're moving in the right direction. Folks, for, through, through the course of Mike's presentation, uh, we will be taking questions at the end and it's possible you can ask questions by pressing the Q&A button, which is sort of right down at the bottom of your screen if you're on a desktop. Um, Mike, I'll uh, share my screen. Why don't you take it away with your presentation? Great, thank you, Chris, and uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Gordon. Uh, so we'll begin uh, today's webinar uh, by just reviewing the objectives or what we would like to accomplish uh, today in terms of our agenda. So first we'll discuss uh, some of the types of, uh, or the types of COVID-19 testing uh, presently uh, available in the market. And then uh, the second item, will be a discussion of how antibody testing uh, differs from the uh, PCR testing uh, that is presently available and uh, end off on considerations uh, for employers um, on introducing uh, antibody testing or what it could uh, mean within employee populations. Um, before we begin down that path, uh, what I thought I'd do is provide a bit of an overview or some background context about how MedCan actually came to uh, secure our supply of uh, uh, the COVID-19 uh, IgG antibody testing. So uh, we've had a long relationship uh, with our lab supplier, Abbott. Uh, we actually began uh, or, or built our lab back in 2005, uh, which we've been using since that time to run the uh, panel of blood tests uh, that are within our uh, preventive screening uh, annual health assessment that we do on site. So long relationship with Abbott. Abbott has been our supplier of equipment and the reagents uh, that we use for our testing in our lab. And as a result of that relationship, when Abbott uh, was the second manufacturer to be approved uh, by Health Canada, uh, for the antibody testing, the IG, what's known as the IgG testing, on May 14th, um, we were able to uh, secure a supply. Um, the actual uh, first uh, approved 
uh, lab manufacturer uh, for antibody testing uh, was Diasorin on May 12th. And I've shared with you here uh, the website, the Health Canada website. If you just actually Google um, Health Canada medical devices uh, appro approvals, uh, this website should come up. And uh, it's an interesting website because it shows all the uh, uh, suppliers, the, the manufacturers uh, that have been approved for COVID-19 testing. I think there's, for some reason, I think there's about uh, 19. Uh, most of those being the, call it the PCR-based testing. And, uh, and it also shows the ones that are pending approval or have submitted to Health Canada and are, are waiting for approval on their type of testing. Um, in terms of MedCan, uh, we are presently targeting late June uh, to provide our antibody testing to our clients on site at MedCan. Uh, to the extent we can charge a fee, uh, abiding by any sort of regulatory requirements, uh, we will charge uh, a fee. There's a number of steps we have to go through uh, internally in terms of setting up our lab and doing uh, internal testing uh, to be able to offer this testing. And that's why the date is presently late June. Thank you, Chris. In terms of the uh, testing options, there's think of it as two types uh, out on uh, or presently uh, available. Um, so on the left column, is uh, testing that tests for the actual presence of the virus itself, whereas the right column is the antibody testing. So I'll, I'll talk in terms of uh, the left column first. Um, so in terms of uh, looking for when somebody is uh, presently infectious or, or infected with the virus, the testing that is out there right now is called PCR-based uh, testing. I always hesitate to uh, to actually pronounce the pronounce the acronym there, uh, uh, but this is uh, so there, it's testing for the actual presence of the virus itself. It's the testing that is presently being done uh, by public health. Um, it's the one that you see that uh, requires the nasal swab, and uh, at the moment um, it's done. I call it sophisticated lab equipment. It's basically uh, large uh, equipment analyzers uh, that this test is being run on. Though I suspect in the next uh, number of weeks, uh, we may see some actual point of care uh, PCR-based testing options coming out. Uh, so for example, you may have seen down in the US, uh, probably about a month ago, President uh, Trump uh, touting uh, on the White House lawn there, um, a unit by Abbott called the ID Now unit, which is kind of like a desktop printer, I guess. Um, but that's a PCR uh, based test uh, unit, not yet available in Canada. The second one I've highlighted here is antigen testing. And uh, from what, I, what I've gathered, uh, there's presently research, the R&D being done on being able to also introduce, introduce antigen testing, uh, which is testing for the proteins on the virus itself. Uh, none yet have been approved uh, by Health Canada. Moving to the right column, uh, this details here the antibody testing, uh, what's known as IgG or IgM um, antibody testing. So this is looking for the creation of antibodies that have been created as a result of somebody having had the disease. So uh, their immune response uh, to COVID-19. Point number two there, um, I've pulled uh, some data to share. Which, actually, which indicates the uh, percent uh, likelihood of a positive result um, as you increase after, uh, of an accurate positive result, as you increase post the number of days of onset of symptoms of COVID-19. So with antibody testing, uh, sometimes if you test too early, uh, you can get, the person could actually, uh, they've had the disease, but you could get a number of false negatives. So that's why you get the 25% sensitivity. The longer you go from the time of onset of the disease, the greater the likelihood of getting an accurate positive result. So on this graph here, on this chart, 14 plus days, displays 100% sensitivity. The antibody testing uh, is focused on what's called serological or blood collection. Uh, the one we've acquired actually requires venipuncture, um, so drawing a vial of blood. 
but some of the point of care options that may become available in the next few weeks um, will also require the one uh, or present the one that requires just that blood prick um, that's put into uh, like a cassette, so more point of care. Uh, still uncertainty around whether antibody testing uh, means full immunity. Uh, uh, though I think there's a few studies that are coming out that show people have developed immunity, but I believe the World Health Organization position uh, is states that there's still uncertainty around that. Both the PCR or the presence of the actual virus testing and the antibody testing, uh, they're both lab-based testing, so using the large equipment, uh, as well as uh, uh, imagine again in a number of weeks, there will be more uh, point of care options becoming available. Um, I'll now turn it back to uh, uh, Dr. Nord uh, to actually share uh, a graph and showing the different types of testing. Thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to walk through this graph because I, I, th this came out just recently and I thought it was uh, a really, although there's lots of lines on the graph, it, it does put everything on one actual page, one slide. So let's, if we move from the left to the right, so on the x-axis we have time, so m sort of the, the zero and then minus one, minus two. Zero uh, is where symptoms start. And then think about the y-axis as being concentration. So we, all, we know that before a person has symptoms, they're infectious. So they're, let's say in this situation, the person uh, was infected a week before symptoms start. During that week, uh, viral replication happens. And at some point, uh, the tests start to become positive. And specifically, if you look across the top, let's just focus on the PCR. So the PCR uh, is likely positive, again, never 100%, but likely positive at about that point that you start to have symptoms. In fact, uh, the more sophisticated PCR tests will be able to be positive most likely even before symptoms uh, arrive. And that's where we have this asymptomatic transfer, uh, transmission, which is, which is really why it's a pandemic as opposed to an outbreak. It's that spread that happens before symptoms start that really uh, facilitates uh, a global spread of, of a virus like this. Um, and then, so if you can see those curves, you know that if you have the PCR swab, that's the, the that blue line and the, the likelihood of that being positive, very high at the beginning, and then trails away. And, and mostly what's the reason why it's trailing away is that our bodies, once the symptoms are, are starting, the body starts to develop these antibodies to literally kill the virus. And that's how, why we met, mount a fever to try and kill the virus. And the two, the two antibodies we talk about, and you'll see in the, the green dotted bar is uh, uh, IgG and the purple dotted bar is IgM. Um, uh, the, basically the IgM goes up a little bit quicker than the IgG and then falls away quicker, whereas the IgG is a little slower onset, onset but then lasts for a longer time. So really many of these tests are focused on the IgG. Now the challenge really is with these uh, tests that although there is a discrete line that's shown here, in fact, the line is a big fuzzy gray line that's very, very fat in real time. And that means that everybody responds differently. All of our immune systems are different and they respond differently to the same dose, let's say, of virus. But especially if the dose of the virus is different, that again is gonna create a variation in terms of how our immune system responds to that dose. So some people, if someone has a very large dose, somebody let's say that was infectious, coughed right in your face and you inhaled and there was no protection, no mask, no PPE and right in front of you, and that very large dose of infectious material will likely cause a very dramatic and quick rise in the IgM and the IgG. There has been studies shown that a more discrete or lower dose of viral load uh, infection will create a more muted response uh, in an average person. So there's lots of variation that happens that varies, the dose will create variation. 
the individual response to the immune, the immune, immune I mean, from an immunological perspective is going to be different. And also, you know, we're only in month six globally of this whole thing. So we really don't even know how long the IgG and the immunity is going to last. Even if we started in January with the first people and we tested them on a monthly basis, we'd still only be at month six. So in, on an average basis, I think most of us are, are, are proceeding with this. The immunity is going to last longer than weeks, but not years. So we're talking months, and that's based on other viral immune responses like influenza A and B, and when we have our shots. You know, it generally doesn't go last for more than a year, and it takes a little bit of time to build up that immunity for those specific viruses as well. So we're moving forward using that model. And the one thing that we do know is the IgG is actually quite specific to this COVID virus. So there is a very, uh, very direct relationship between having an exposure to this COVID-19 and the IgG that develops against that, which is great, except we fully expect, and there has been to date some mutation happening on an ongoing basis with the COVID-19 virus. So if it totally mutates into something different, that IgG is now not protective against that new strain of virus. We have been watching very slight mutations, but so far the virus is essentially the same virus that's been with us all the way along. And the very slight changes that have happened have not really affected the infectivity or the transmissibility of the virus. So this is uh, an important, I wanted to kind of go through that because these uh, curves, again, are an average and not an, uh, an N of one, whereas we would say like an individual person might react very differently than what this graph is. And that's part of the challenge with this test. So you're going to hear in the media quite a lot of uh, mixed reviews around the, the serological testing or the immune testing and the idea of an immune passport and, and some of people are gonna fall in favor of that. Some, and it really comes down to these basic principles that on a given individual, it is difficult to say exactly uh, how strong the immune response is gonna be. And most importantly, for how long is the immune response gonna last going forward? And so the only way to do that, uh, to define that would be to, on a, literally on a month to month basis, have a repeat a blood sample and measure the immune, measure that IgG amount and, where, and see where you are on the graph. You know, at some point, the IgG wanes to the point where uh, it doesn't create the kind of protection that it should. So at some point, the immunity against the COVID-19 is, is lost. We just don't have a good sense of that. But that information and that, those studies are happening now. So over the next few months, we'll have a much better information uh, and a picture of really what that's looking like uh, going forward. So that's the graph. It uh, kind of goes through in, in one touch of the eye, uh, a bit of what happens from an immune perspective and the two types of testing, the PCR and the antibody testing. And ultimately what's a, a, a great option is if you can put both of these tests together. So if you marry a PCR test with an antibody test, now you've got something that says, uh, whether the virus is still present or absent, and whether you have the immune uh, protection against the virus going forward. So marrying the two tests is a very interesting uh, option. A little more work. Uh, it requires some sort of a blood sample and, and, a, and a nasal swab or a, sal or a saliva sample. Uh, but it does create a much better picture of uh, the state of the being for an individual person. So that's kind of the slide that, uh, again, and with one slide, it kind of explains a lot of the immune system uh, functioning and, and where the tests come to play. Thanks very much, Peter. Uh, employer considerations. Um, so there are a number here. Um, Mike, are you going to take that or are we, is that uh, Peter? Yeah, I, can, I think I can take that. Uh, so these are a couple of, from an employer perspective, and, and again, folding this into our safe at work uh, system. The, 
so how does an employer uh, utilize some of these these tests? And again, it's the it's the PC, again, a PCR test, serological testing. Right now, it, it can become a very important part of an overall approach to screening with the understanding going into it of the limitations of the, especially the serological testing. But it does, uh, at least for some period of time, after the test is, is uh, positive, it does offer protection against employees working in a uh, congregate setting. So working on site, uh, working in close proximity with others. We're still not gonna say stop using PPE. Uh, obviously social distancing is gonna be with us for the foreseeable future. We don't see that uh, uh, decreasing at all. But it's a, one more piece of information that an employer can use to help get a handle on uh, from the employee population, how are we doing uh, almost as, a, as its own microcosm, its own population, what kind of protection are, is our population uh, de demonstrating against the COVID-19? And that'll help in terms of a return to on-site work. Um, question two is MedCan considering employer options for testing. We absolutely are. As Mike has said right now, we're really focusing on, on what we can do at 150 York which makes the, the logistics of working with an employer, especially on an on-site perspective, uh, a bit of a challenge, but not insurmountable. And as Mike has also suggested, within the next short period of time, there should be more point of care tests uh, approved for use in Canada. And uh, we have our foot in the door uh, to be the first uh, to be able to access those on behalf of our, our private clients, as well as our corporate clients. And so, with the point of care testing, that makes the whole logistics much, much easier. Uh, we can do on-site screening uh, with, uh, with the finger prick that uh, is very uh, accurate and be very helpful in terms of, again, thinking about the overall employee perspective and, and frankly, providing uh, a bit of a, um, a reassurance factor to the employees. You know, there are, many of our employees are struggling right now with uh, self-isolation and and the mental health challenges that come along with that. And you know, some of this can be just be allaying some of those anxieties that uh, you know, either I've, I've had COVID or I haven't. You know, many, many people, uh, have, when some of these tests have been applied, especially in the US, have had no symptoms at all. And, and they'll be the first people to think, uh, wow, I'm kind of surprised. I, I'm, I'm positive for the immunological side. And yet I never really had you know, major symptoms at all. But clearly, I was exposed to COVID, and uh, and now I'm I'm immune to it. And then number three, uh, how can we remain updated about testing options for employers? Uh, stay tuned. Uh, we'll be updating through all of our social media platforms and our information, getting out to our uh, corporate clients and our private clients as we offer more and more testing uh, around COVID. Again, COVID nineteen is with us uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, MedCan is committed to making sure that we're providing the, uh, the best level of care and service for, for all of our clients, whether they be private or corporate. And whether that's uh, at 150 York Street or whether that's remote uh, or virtual, that's our commitment. That's the new world that we're in. And uh, very excited as we start to move forward into that world. And uh, again, we're in a, a symbiotic relationship with this virus for the foreseeable future. And uh, I think to be proactive and think uh, about how we can uh, work with, uh, with that relationship going forward uh, will behoove all of us to, uh, to start to think about, think about the, the future in those terms and think about our own uh, strategic planning uh, about in that regard and how we're gonna deal with uh, keeping our employees safe in that new world. So that's sort of the state of the being uh, with uh, antibody testing as of uh, this week. Thanks, Peter. Uh, that was wonderful. We do have questions. Um, one that I wanted to ask right off the top is uh, why this test or what are the advantages of this form of antibody testing uh, as compared to other uh, forms of antibody testing? So, you know, I, I think there are various, this type of antibody testing, they have various levels of accuracy. What are the advantages of this specific one that MedCan has chosen? I can
probably start yeah, and Mike, you can certainly answer. But, uh, you know, I, I think from my perspective, some of the negative press that people were hearing about this test coming out of the States as we delved into that was not so much the test itself, but how the how the, the sample was 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 taken and how it was transported to the lab. And if that takes more than a, a little bit of time, the accuracy and the quality started to drop. And I think the benefit of having the test at 150 York is that we can draw and literally walk it down the hall to the lab. So it's instantaneous between the, the taking of the blood, which again, by venipuncture is highly controlled. We have professionals that do that. And then literally, uh, you know, a, a two minute walk to the, to the lab and processing happens very quickly. So as I look at it, that's it's one of the, the variables in some of the testing that we've seen so far. And it's one of the reasons why we're pretty excited about having this testing offered because the quality control, uh, we, can, con we can actually monitor and, and supervise that uh, very, very closely. Um. Yeah, I mean, the, the fact that this is, you know, that when people hear about antibody tests, there some of the American tests, you were telling me, Peter, uh, that some of the antibody tests are, they're uh, based on a pinprick, uh, basically blood sample that are then couriered, you know, and can take uh, days and days to get to the actual lab. Whereas this is an actual blood sample and uh, is walked to the lab within minutes. With I mean, that's a wonderful yeah. thing. So. Right. Let's go through the um, some of the questions that are being submitted. Uh, I mean, this one is, um, so if someone has symptoms back at the beginning of the year, will the antibody test be effective or would six months be too long? Peter. Yeah, so as I, as I sort of said, it, it's it's really unknown at this point. We think the, the, the immune uh, response will last months. How many months, we don't know for sure, I think. You know, I think we're pretty comfortable when we say three months, four months, and when we start to get beyond that. And again, the, as I said in my piece, the, the individual variations is what gets you. We could say on average four or five months, but that means some, some people could be one month, some could be 12 months. Uh, it's just that we don't, we don't have the research to be able to tell us that just yet. Early days. Um, Next question. Uh, this is related to the logistics of the or the actual mechanics of the provision. Will MedCan offer the test to the public at a cost or only as an add-on for patients with a full assessment? Uh, so presently we're looking, so I'll, I'll answer that question. Um, so yes, uh, we will offer the test to our clients at a cost as an add-on to the health assessment, um, but we will also offer it as a standalone appointment uh, for our clients. That's great. Um, uh, another question, will I have to self-isolate if I get a positive result with the antibody testing? Yeah, that, that's a great question. The, the need to self-isolate ideally goes away immediately. So if, if you have a positive IgG, and again, I'm assuming at that point, you don't, the person doesn't have symptoms, they're not feverish, they're not, they're not coughing, they're not having any other developed, those symptoms have gone away and their IgG is now positive. And again, uh, from Mike's graph, that, that may take a full two weeks after the, the, the actual infection and or symptoms resolution. But the, at the point that the IgG becomes strongly positive, which again is after two weeks, at that point, there should be good protection against a re reinfection with the COVID-19 virus. And so the need for self-isolation at that point goes away. And so that's one of the real benefits of the test. Uh, also, if you're in a, in, a, in a home setting and you're providing care for others, the, uh, the chances that you're gonna be reinfected is, is very, very low at that point. And, as, and although we can't say uh, too much about whether that person is infectious for others, it would also make sense at that point that the infectivity of, of the person to others is also very much reduced. Again, if they're not having symptoms and they have the positive IgG. As I said, the best is to also have a PCR test and then you know for 100% whether you're shedding uh, virus and whether you're infectious at that period. 
Uh, we're a little bit over time. Uh, we do try to keep these to uh, a mass of 30 minutes, but let's take one more question. Um, do we know that uh, if you test that you have antibodies, are you truly immune from catching it again? Yeah, yeah and again, that's the same, it's sort of the same answer, really. Uh, you know, that how long that lasts, we don't know. And ever again, for sure, you will be, you know, th this, this is going to, the immune system will, will decrease over time and you'll need, and you then will become, you know, opened and, uh, and to having a reinfection. You know, one of the things that we hope for, of course, in the next year is that we have a vaccine developed. And although no vaccine is 100% effective, even if it's 70 or 80%, that's going to be the way that we are basically going to trigger everybody's immune system to become active against COVID-19. And that's essentially how we're going to beat this thing. The combination of kind of the herd immunity where people are just cross inoculating each other in the community as sort of what's happening now. And then you layer on top of that the vaccine which develops that IgG. And eventually we'll all have this IgG uh, for a certain period of time. And that'll hopefully keep the COVID-19 at bay until it may mutate and, and then join the other two influenza A and B viruses and becomes uh, influenza A, B, and C as part of our annual uh, flu season. Uh, I think some of these answers, just you know, how new this virus is, is uh, um, how much we know, how much we don't know about it is, is remarkable. Um, thanks very much, Michael and uh, Peter. I'm just going to um, walk to the final slide here, which is, gosh, let me get to this uh, slideshow again. Uh, oh gosh, let me go through. Sorry, so we do these Safe at Work System webinars every Tuesday. The next one is about contact tracing. It's called Tracing the Challenge of Containing Future Outbreaks. That's Tuesday, June 9 at 12.30 p.m. That's with uh, MedCan's president, Ashim Kamani, and our uh, vice president of digital, Jordan Gracie. The following week, uh, Tuesday, June 16, is about treatment, what happens after infection, um, you know, one of your employees has contacted the coronavirus and, and how do you manage what happens next, essentially. And these are uh, employer-facing webinars. These are meant to be resources for employers rather than the actual, uh, you know, this is for people who are running companies and thinking, how do I keep my, um, how do I keep my employee workforce uh, available uh, to help? Sorry. Um, Thanks very much. We're going to be posting this uh, on YouTube, uh, the MedCan channel. Uh, we'll do that within 24 hours. We'll send out an email with a link to the YouTube uh, video. And in addition, we'll include links uh, such as Mike Saliga's uh, Health Canada link um, that talked about the various forms of antibody testing that are being considered by Health Canada. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, and folks, thanks uh, for joining us. Have a safe week and we'll see you next Tuesday.